Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Jack West, and I'm a medical oncologist in Seattle, Washington, and the founder and CEO of GRACE, the global resource for advancing cancer education. This is the second part of a program done in partnership with the Longevity Foundation, covering the topic of ALK inhibition from basic science to FDA-approved anti-cancer therapy for patients whose tumors have an ALK rearrangement. In Part 1, which is available as a separate podcast, Dr. Ben Solomon from the Peter McCallum Cancer Center in Melbourne, Australia, covered the initial discovery of ALK rearrangements in the lab, as well as the early development of the ALK inhibitor crizotinib and the subsequent clinical research that led to it now becoming a commercially available therapy as Zalcori. The second part of the presentation was by Dr. Ross Kamich, a medical oncologist and the director of the Thoracic Oncology Program, at the University of Colorado in Denver. Just over 18 months ago, Dr. Kamich did a tremendous presentation for us back when this was still a very early story, and he's remained a pivotal part of that story since that time. His presentation focuses on a range of implications of crizotinib in terms of screening and considerations for potentially valuable treatments after crizotinib for ALK-positive patients. Here's Dr. Kamich. Thanks very much. I've entitled my sort of part two of this sort of double act, Adventures in the Screening Trade. And for anyone who knows what that's a reference to, I'll explain that at the end. And then partly because crizotinib is not a cure, we have to recognize that we have to plan for what happens when the crizotinib stops working and really to look at what we're going to do in terms of life beyond crizotinib. These are my disclosures. I've advised a number of different drug companies who are trying to develop compounds that work in outpositive lung cancer, and I was an investigator on the Isaac Crizotinib studies. Let me start by talking about screening for ALK patients. So these are all ALK-positive patients, and how do we find them? They're all individuals. They're all different. The only thing that they happen to have in common is they're unfortunate enough to have the same molecular abnormality in a cancer that they didn't ask for. And what I'm going to briefly comment on is the different techniques. And I'm only going to comment on it briefly because with crizotinib being licensed, it's licensed in conjunction with a test. It's only for people who are proven to be ALK positive. And the actual licensing language says you have to be proven ALK positive by an FDA approved test. And there is currently only one FDA approved test, and that's the FISH test that Ben showed you earlier. So in terms of the real world, knowing about these other tests at the moment isn't going to make any difference, but just in terms of looking to the future, other techniques, immunohistochemistry, which is a way of looking at the protein, RT-PCR, which is a way of amplifying specific bits of DNA and and various other tests, I think will come, and they probably will become FDA-approved tests in the future, but at the moment I wouldn't worry about it. If people want to ask specific tests about fish testing, we can cover those later. What I really want to talk about is something which is the idea as to who to screen. Given that you can only give crizotinib to somebody who's proven to be ALK positive, I've gone on record as saying, therefore, if you want to treat everybody who's potentially treatable, i.e. you have to catch everybody who's ALK positive, the only way to do that, unless you can define a group that has a 0% chance of being positive, is to screen everybody. However, some may say that's a relatively naive approach because it's clearly recognized that the odds of being ALK positive vary depending on several different factors. There are groups which have a much higher chance of being ALK positive and groups which have a much lower chance of being ALK positive. And increasingly, when you recognize that those factors exist, the cost-effectiveness of screening for ALK is starting to be discussed. And although cost-effectiveness is not as sexy as a new understanding or a new treatment for cancer, It's the real world, and unless we understand cost-effectiveness, we'll always be simply the recipients of those decisions and not an active participant. So if you'll indulge me, I'm going to talk a little bit about cost-effectiveness. And the key thing to understand about cost-effectiveness is it depends on the perspective you're adopting. So if you're the person who's holding the purse strings, it's easy to understand the perspective. You're trying to decide if it's appropriate for you individually to pay, let's say, about $1,000 to screen your tumor to see if it's out positive. And you might be able to look up based on the factors that you know about yourself, you know, whether you're a smoker, how old you are, what type of lung cancer you have down the microscope, your individual odds of being positive. And then you can imagine yourself as a bit like being at Vegas and you're standing at the gaming tables. You can decide individually whether you want to place the bet of $1,000, knowing that you have a 1% or 10% or 50% chance of winning, and knowing that if you win, you will win access to the drug and decide whether that's a bet that you wish to make. But we don't all hold the purse strings for all of our healthcare, 
And indeed, in many places, it's the government or large insurance firms, such as Kaiser or Medicare, who are actually holding most of the purse strings. And therefore, the perspective is not of an individual, but of society. And there, the calculation is done rather differently, because what the societal view will do is it has to take into account the cost of all of those people who you pay for screening, but who actually have a negative result. And all of those negative costs have to be added to the overall cost of the one person who then turns out to be positive and actually gets treated. Let me try and illustrate that in the next slide. So here's a worked example. At the moment, the fish test does cost about $1,000. Sometimes it's slightly more than that. But let's imagine only one in a 100 people is positive. So from a societal perspective, it's going to cost you $100,000 just to find one positive. $1,000 for Mrs. Jones, who is positive, plus the cost of the other 99 people you've screened who are negative. What that actually means is we're talking about the cost of the drug, which prosopinib has been put on the market at something like $9,600 a month. But even at those prices and with screening costing $1,000 a person, when the frequency of the abnormality you're looking at, out positivity, is relatively low in the screen population, so about 5% or less, the overall costs are actually hugely dominated by the screening and not the cost of the drug, which is hard to get your head around. Surely, you know, $10,000 a month is the big deal, the cost of the drug. Well, no, if you have to pay $100,000 to find that one person to even treat with the drug in the first place. So the screening, particularly at low frequencies of a marker, can have a huge impact on the cost effectiveness. And that's why there's going to be a real push from some people to adopt what you might call enrichment policies. Let me show you what I mean by an enrichment policy. We had published about this time last year that you could introduce a series of filters when you're essentially sitting in the clinic as a physician to increase the hit rate of ALK positive screening in the patient you had in front of you. So you could screen everybody who had advanced non-small cell lung cancer, NSCL in this slide, but if you only screened those with adenocarcinoma, a specific subtype of lung cancer down the microscope, you would capture most of the outpositive people, so your hit rate would go up. If you only took the people with adenocarcinoma who were never smokers, again, you'd be screening a smaller population, but most of the outpositive patients would be concentrated in that group, and again, your hit rate would go up. And the most extreme filter was if they had lung cancer, adenocarcinoma, never smokers, and were negative on two other molecular tests, which tended to be different diseases. And you can see if you look at the second in column and the fourth in column, that as you go down each column, the savings of enrichment are twofold. First of all, you end up screening absolutely fewer people. So if you just screened adenocarcinoma and never smokers who were EGFR and carous wild type, you only end up screening 2% of the lung cancer population. And the second screening, the second saving, is that when you screen those people, your hit rate in that group is much higher. So there's a real push to say, what about identifying these factors that can enrich for people who are positive for the market you're interested in? The analogy you can sometimes use is there's a certain number of fish, if you'll excuse the expression of the word fish in two contexts here, a certain number of fish in a pond, and what you do is you scoop out a whole bunch of the water and throw it away, and now when you drop your line in the water, your chances of actually catching a fish go up because most of them are left behind. However, there is a cost associated with this enrichment policy. And if I go back to my fishing analogy, sometimes when you scoop that water out and throw it away, some fishes are lost in that group as well. Because each of these enrichment steps is not perfect. Although they may capture most of the people who are ALK positive, they will miss some. And if you look in the two right-hand columns here, in this worked example, there are 16 lung cancer cases out of initial 1,000. If you only screened adenocarcinomas, you'd capture 14 of them, but you'd miss two of them. If you only screened adenocarcinoma and never smokers, you'd miss half of the ALK positive cases. So these are the cost of enrichment is actually these non-screened cases, these true missed positives. And we don't really have a way of calculating that, but it's something we have to think about. Therefore, when we're talking about who to screen, we have to recognize that the push for enrichment strategies, only screening some members of the lung cancer population, may be an economic necessity when we're thinking about screening for rare diseases that are down in the kind of 1% to 5% frequency. But we also have to recognize that any enrichment leaves people behind. Now, that may seem like a kind of terrible Sophie's choice to make here, but there are alternative ways. And one way is simply to reduce the cost of the screening test per person. 
So it's not $1,000 per person per test, but if it was $100 or $50, you could screen a lot more people cost-effectively. Or the other way to do it is you're not just screening for one abnormality for $1,000, but you're screening for 50 different abnormalities. You could screen for EGFR and KRAS and BRAF and many other molecular abnormalities at the same time. And those kind of multiplexed assays, which will bring down the cost of testing because your hit rate will go up because you will have a 30% hit rate, but there'll be for 10 different abnormalities will come in the future. All right, let's move on to the more traditional things that physicians talk about and new drugs. So what happens when crizotinib stops working? Well, there are other ALK inhibitors out there. Crizotinib is the only licensed one, and as you heard, it's only licensed in the U.S., and it's the only one that's licensed specifically for ALK. But another drug, pemetrexid, also called Olympta, which is an intravenous chemotherapy, we're starting to see actually has very increased activity in ALK-positive lung cancer, and it's actually been a licensed treatment in general since about 2004. And then two other classes of drugs are starting to be explored within clinical trials something called heat shock protein 90 inhibitors or HSP90 inhibitors are starting to show evidence of increased activity in ALK positive lung cancer. And then beyond crizotinib, many other ALK inhibitors are starting to be developed. Well, we'll deal with pemetrexid first. Well, what do we know about it? Well, it's very much an evolving data set, but we do know that ALK positive patients who've been treated with Olympta compared to sort of average ALK negative patients have a much longer time before their cancer starts to grow, that's called progression-free survival, and a much higher response rate than these other groups. In a recent series, the response rate was 40% as opposed to 14%. But you have to put your hand up and say these are all relatively small series. The only reassuring thing is the first series, which we published early in the year from Colorado, was fairly convincingly replicated by a completely independent group coming out of South Korea. So... The fact that two completely independent groups in different parts of the world are seeing a very similar thing does make you feel that it may be a genuine phenomenon. The other thing to take home from this message is I don't think anyone is saying that Alinda only works in out positive cancer, simply that the people who are super responders to this drug tend to be more concentrated amongst the out positive group. And I can show that if I just take one figure from the first of these papers. So this is like the waterfall plot that Ben showed, only now we're not looking at the response of the cancer, we're looking at the time it takes for the cancer to grow, and that's the progression-free survival measured in months on the horizontal axis. Again, each of those lines is an individual patient treated with Olympta, either Olympta on its own or Olympta combined with some other drugs in a combination therapy. We split it into four groups. The first group was EGFR mutant lung cancer, and the second was KRAS mutant lung cancer, the third was out positive lung cancer, and the third was a group that we called triple negative for all of those three markers. And I think you can see a couple of things here. Firstly, that in the out positive group, there are more people with longer bars, so more people tend to do better. But it's not everybody. There are some people who don't do that well on Olympta. The other thing that's clear is that there are some people with very long bars in some of the other groups as well, particularly in the KRAS mutant group. So some people just being out positive isn't the only group who's benefiting. But the alcohol group tends to concentrate these people who are doing very well on Olympta. The other thing to take home from this figure is that all of the people in the study had, even if they were out positive, had not seen crizotinib. They were crizotinib naive. So what is the significance of this pemetrexid or Olympta, which is its trace name significance? Well, three things stand out. Firstly, if you're doing very well on pemetrexid and nobody has tested your tumor, I would at least think about being tested for whether the tumor is ALK positive. But as you've seen, uh, it's not a guarantee. You could, for example, have one of these other molecular abnormalities. The second thing is if you're ALK positive and you're on crizotinib and it stops working and you've never seen pemetrexid, then to at least think about going on to pemetrexid as another line of defense. Now, everyone in those studies had actually gone the other way around. They had had pemetrexid and then gone on to crizotinib and we have very limited data on the other way around, and we don't fully know whether being resistant to crizotinib is going to affect your outcomes with pemetrexid. What I can tell you is at least of the two patients I've treated in that scenario, both of them have responded. Finally, if you're in a country where you know that you're out positive, but you don't have access to crizotinib, then at least knowing that pemetrexid is a drug that you might have significant activity with means that maybe is where you'd want to go. All right, now let's talk about some of the newer drugs so some of the new ALK inhibitors that are in development. 
Well, there is a long list, and it's always out of date as people develop new drugs and as they move through from just being in the laboratory into clinical trials. What I can tell you is although some of these clinical trials have started, there is not yet any information available on how they're doing that's available within the public domain, and we'll just have to wait and see with regard to that. But you may ask yourself if crizotinib is looking so good, and Ben's slides show that it's really very efficacious and pretty well tolerated, why do we need any new ALK inhibitors? Well, you can raise a couple of reasons. Firstly, even though crizotinib seems pretty well tolerated, no drug is completely clean. You heard that crizotinib has activity against MET and possibly some other molecules in the human body. And maybe a slightly cleaner ALK inhibitor, or at least one that hits ALK and some other things, may have a different and, for some people, more preferable side effect profile. Crizotinib is a tablet, so it's pretty easy to take, but it is given twice a day. And maybe some of these new drugs might only be given once a day. But these seem relatively small reasons, and I think most people are interested in new ALK inhibitors because of their potential to work when the crizotinib stops working. And when crizotinib stops working, it really stops working in one of two ways, because people's cancers either grow within the brain, and that raises the possibility, I'll show you that maybe the crizotinib isn't penetrating into the brain very well, and maybe some of these newer drugs will either a greater percentage will get into the brain, or even if the same percentage gets in, if the drug is more potent, it will still be able to have activity. Or, because when people's cancers originally shrink in their body and then start to grow despite the crizotinib still being there, the actual biology of the cancer may have changed. And maybe some of these new drugs may have activity in that new biology when the crizotinib is no longer working. And that's called acquired resistance. So let's take a look at some of those. So let's look at the brain as an example. So this is a case from Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, treated by Daniel Costa. He's an excellent physician there. A young man who had excellent control of his disease with the crizotinib, but started to develop some deposits in the brain. And in the MRI scan that you can see on the right-hand side, these are the little white deposits in the brain that are shown with very small black arrows. What they did in this young man was they were able to take a blood sample and a sample of the fluid around the brain, what's called the cerebrospinal fluid, or CFF, about five hours after he took the standard dose of crizotinib. And what they showed is that compared to the levels in the blood, less than 0.3% was getting into the brain, raising the possibility that these levels were actually just too low to work on the ALK-positive cancer cells within the brain. Now, that sounds a little worrying, but we've got to take a few words of warning here. Firstly, this is only a single patient, and we're all different. Secondly, the so-called barrier between the blood and the brain can vary both between individuals and depending on what's happened in individuals. So if you'd had radiotherapy or a very heavy burden of disease within the brain, maybe the barrier's not as intact and maybe more will get through. But it does raise the possibility that if the brain might be an Achilles heel when it comes to crizotinib, we should at least think about scanning people's brains before they start and certainly keeping an eye on it when they're on the therapy. Let's talk about change in the underlying biology. So this is a different scenario. This is where your cancer's initially responded and then starts to grow despite the crizotinib still being there. And this is one of my patients. And if you look in the top left-hand panel, this is their initial PET scan. And all those big white blobs are heavy deposits of the ALK positive cancer in the liver and around the kidneys shown by the blue arrows. In July 2009, she went on crizotinib. And you can see over the next two panels on the top level, everything disappeared. She had a complete response. And about nine months later, now we're in the bottom left-hand panel at about April 2010, suddenly with close surveillance, a little dot appears. And that was a PET positive dot in her right adrenal gland. And we biopsied and showed that it was cancer. And that was logged as progression in the graph that Ben showed with people taking about 10 months to progress. She would be one of those cases. But what we decided was because all of the rest of her disease, all the heavy stuff in the scan above her, was still very much under control, we were allowed to treat that one deposit and keep the crizotinib going. And we treated it with something called SBRT, stereotactic body radiation therapy, which has trade names like gamma knife and cyber knife. And so we zapped that, kept the crizotinib going, and then a few months went by and another little dot turned up and we did exactly the same thing, zapped it and kept the crizotinib going. And we repeated that several times, extending the overall duration of disease control to nearly double that from when the cancer first started to progress. But apart from the fact that you can use radiotherapy to zap these little lesions, what I really want you to take home is that even in that last panel in the bottom right-hand side, compare that to the top left-hand side, 
most of her disease is still really well under control. All of the cancer hasn't got smart, just some of it. And we're starting to realize how the cancer gets smart. And one way is that the ALK molecule develops an additional mutation, which means that a crizotinib is not as active in those cancer cells anymore. Several different crizotinib resistance mutations have been described, and multiple ones can be generated in the laboratory. And they're not all the same. Some are more resistant to the drug than others. Indeed, some of them can even coexist together. One of the first cases, two, were described in the same patient. And indeed, they may also coexist with something called second drivers. So these are completely separate molecules, separate from ALK, which are also stepping up to the plate to drive the cancer cell. And the only one that's actually been described in a patient is, not surprisingly, something we've heard about in other lung cancers, something called EGFR, epidermal growth factor receptor signaling. This one, not because it has a mutation, it just seems to be driving harder. So cancers can squirm out of control from the drug, the crizotinib, in different ways. They can alter the target for the drug, get extra mutations in the ALK, or they can bring up a friend who will help them drive the cancer cell despite the crizotinib still being there. But what we still don't know is how frequently does each mechanism occur, and are we talking 50% get mutations or 10% or 5%? How often do the second drivers occur and what are the different second drivers? It's still very much a work in progress. But let me talk about another class of drugs which may have activity in this resistance setting, and that's the HSP90 inhibitors. What's well, a heat shock protein? Well, essentially, it's a car seat for these abnormal proteins. So in my picture, the giraffe is the eml 4 alk fusion protein. It's a little fragile. It's a little vulnerable because it's an unusual protein that doesn't exist in nature. And in order to get it to mature properly, you've got to protect it. And a heat shock protein is called a chaperonin. It wraps around these proteins and keeps them safe. If you come in with a heat shock protein 90 inhibitor, so 90 is the particular molecule, it does the equivalent of throwing the giraffe out of the car seat, and it's an unhappy molecule. It doesn't hang around as much. These drugs are only available in clinical trials. I've given the names of a couple there, STA-1990 and IPI-504, and they're mostly intravenous. But in the lab, they seem to disrupt these fusion proteins, whether there's a resistance mutation there or not, because they just disrupt the whole molecule. And that offers a lot of promise as a potential way of treating crizotinib-resistant disease. But there is both promise and some concern over that when we see the clinical data. And two groups, and I'm only showing data from one group here, have published some studies of these HSP-19 inhibitors in patients. The first thing to note is another waterfall plot this time of response of the tumor. If you look in the far right-hand side, the red bars going down are ALK-positive patients all responding to the drug. Great. That's exactly what we want them to do. But the key thing is all of those ALK-positive patients, just like in my Alemta study, are crizotinib-naive. What's a little more sobering is the patients who had failed crizotinib and then went on to the study are unfortunately the two yellow bars with the asterisks on the left-hand side, and they're not responding to the drug. Now, that's different from what we're seeing in the lab, where people who have resistance mutations are responding to HSP-19 inhibitor, at least their cells are. But these patients on the left-hand side, I don't know that they have an ALK mutation. They've just stopped responding to the crizotinib. They may have one of these second drivers, and if that second driver doesn't care whether HSP-90 is there or not, then maybe it won't respond. And it brings up the idea that if molecularly profiling your patient to say you're ALK positive in the first place is important, potentially molecularly profiling you when the crizotinib stops working to figure out your mechanism resistance and direct you to the right drug may be equally important. So I think I'm now on the summary slides. This is regard to where do we go beyond crizotinib. Well, crizotinib and pemetrexid are both licensed therapies with activity in ALK positive lung cancer. Crizotinib is specific to ALK. Pemetrexid just seems to be having uh, increased activity in ALK. It's unclear whether resistance to one will affect resistance to the other, and I think that's a work in progress. In terms of crizotinib developing acquired resistance, partly this is through the drug penetrating into the brain, and partly through changes in the biology of the cancer. Out mutations and other second drivers are now starting to be described, although we still don't know the frequency with which each occurs. The next generation of ALK inhibitors and drugs called HSP-90 inhibitors may have activity against some of the resistance mutations that are being described, but it's unclear if these drugs will penetrate into the brain, and it's unclear how much these drugs will have resistance through means other than just these ALK mutations and the frequency with which these different mechanisms will occur.
And at least in theory, when there's two drivers, you may require drugs in combination or a much broader approach, such as chemotherapy. I wanted to end with just a couple of pictures. So we talked a lot about people, and it's sometimes nice just to put faces to names. And these are many of the people who are involved in the development of chrysotinib. And on the far left, this is somebody who you'd never see a picture of. This is Keith Wilner from Pfizer. And he was really the sort of gentle genius of this who helped to shepherd it along and really get a drug from the very earliest studies all the way through to a licensing. And he was a fantastic guy to work with. Next in, you can see Dr. Sullivan. Then Dr. Ignatius Ou, our colleague from University of California, Irvin, who'd shown you the PET scan earlier. Myself, and finally on the right-hand side is Dr. Alice Shaw from Massachusetts General Hospital, who's just been fantastic to work with and has really helped to lead a lot of developments in this field with a very large group of ALK positive patients at Massachusetts General. I think my last slide is to explain where my title, Adventures in the Screening Trade, comes from and to buy a book called Adventures in the Screen Trade by William Goldman, who was the screenwriter for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And since Ben and I have done a little double act here, I've shown that picture, and I'd be more than happy with pictures at this point. You can decide which one of us is uh, Butch and of us is Sundance. Thanks very much. We'll end the program here with our next and last podcast in the series covering the question and answer session from this activity with Dr. Solomon and Kamich. Thanks again to the Longevity Foundation for their co-sponsorship with Grace to make this activity possible.